written this one. Honorable Ross Keith Swain is from Singapore and is the leadership co consultant, coach, trainer, speaker, and podcaster. He is the CEO of Soul Inspired Leadership PTE Limited, and he'll be sharing with us this morning on Leadership Style Part 2. <laughs> Honorable Ross Keith Swain is, works internationally with his projects encompassing many diverse cultural backgrounds. Throughout the year, Mr. Ross has developed a growing desire to put an ongoing emphasis in bringing more so into business, and he believes that the most effective leaders stay true to their authenticity by being so inspired and it starts by being able to lead themselves and if you want to get in touch with honorable roskiv please go to www.soul/inspired-leadership.com and you can also connect with him on linkedin and twitter he is the ceo of So Inspired Leadership PTE Limited, and also the Managing Director of Asia Pacific FC Global Strategies. Honorable Ross is a perceptive and responsive leadership consultant, coach, and trainer with broad experience in varied industries worldwide, continually helping leaders to reduce their stress in managing people, including themselves. Honorable Ross is also a dynamic speaker and podcaster with outstanding skills in communication, presentation, training, and interpersonal relations. So on this note, let's welcome Honorable Ross Keith swine from Singapore to teach us from his wealth of knowledge and wisdom this month. You are welcome, sir. Yes, happy to be here, Elizabeth. Now let's get this sharing of my slides, which we had an acute failure the other day. So we're back. Ah <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're we're back. We're back on we're back on the problem in my my ribbons, anyway, might get too technical, but that's about I'm as good as I can get. Technical <laughs> so we have that, and and it's all about as we as I spoke on on Monday, management styles are a nice to know your style, but it's a description of your behaviours, and it's very broad. For people who live based on their style in leadership, it doesn't work so much because there is a there's a good end of the style and there's also a negative end of that style. The key is to focus on behaviours, of which some of those behaviours will be in certain in that style and others will be in another style, and it's a mixture. And the key is the behaviour, which is what we're talking about now. We did the other day talk about some critical behaviours. So there again, it's about style versus substance. Style is one thing, it's about your behaviour, which I just said, right? Um, it is a broad description. And the key is that behaviour. And what we're, we're looking at the other day, which we'll look at again today for a while, is the fact that uh, we're talking about paradox theory um, from Dr. Dan Harrison of Harrison Assessments. And that, that what that is, is the paradox is the result of integrating two seemingly contradictory behaviours that both contribute to an individual's success. And the examples we gave to the other day in which One's always easy to understand is in communication, you're either blunt or you're diplomatic. And you think they're seemingly they're contradictory, but you need to have them both. You don't be blunt. You just want to be direct and tell people the right message, but at the same time do it in a diplomatic way. So it's the contribute, it's the it's the merging of those two behaviors that's key. And that's that's what we'll continue on today. So when we get to other behaviours, and I'll pick, there's, there's about 12 all up, 
12 styles, but I try to um, pick the ones that to me are more, create the most problems when <laughs> that I come across as a coach. So for example, now we're looking at, it's that power, your interpersonal, it's an interpersonal skill. It's the enduring and positive relationship built on mutual needs. Now this one, it, it, break it. there again, the contradictory behaviors are, I'm very assertive, the tendency to put forward my personal wants and needs. That is very important. At the same time, I'm helpful. The tendency, then that is the tendency to respond to others' needs and assist and support others to achieve their goals. Now, as a leader, you've got to do that all the time. But the, but in, in that in that you've got to keep the balance of keeping and looking after your own wants and needs. You can't be up one end and not the other. And as I mentioned the other day, that if you're sitting in one end, and let's take helpful because it, it's it's the more the passive behaviour, assertive is more aggressive, it's the more dynamic behaviour. So let's we're up one end and we're super helpful. And this is the problem I see quite a lot um, in in leaders, particularly young leaders who are, who are going through the motions and, and, and growing their career. They haven't learned how to change because they, they, they try to be super, quite often super helpful. The trouble is under pressure, because they're not usurping their own wants and needs, under a lot of pressure they revert and they suddenly explode and yell at you and, and wander off. And I'm sure if you think about it, you think, yeah, I know some people have done that. Totally out of character. Why don't we do it? You're always asking me to join or wander off. That's because they're too helpful and don't look after themselves. So the key is there again is balancing those traits. And 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 the questions I get you to ask yourself and have a think about it. This is the improving your self awareness. Now I do these exercises of what we've got here, and I, I do it over well, probably over a day or two days in training people. So it takes time. We go through it. I'm just going through this and saying, well, there's some questions. Ask yourself those questions. And be honest with yourself. In other words, do I usually think of myself first, or do I usually put others before myself? In other words, I'm a martyr. And the key is, I like to help others, but I know when to say no. It's about prioritising. So keep that in mind. It's about prioritising. Yes, I've got to help people, but I understand at times I must say no. And one little hint on this, I, I, I often, this is one thing I often see where, where leaders are just like, no, can't do it, and storm off. Well, people then feel rejected. If you're going to say no, tell them why. Say, no, look, I'm sorry I can't do this. I'm working on something now that's a very high priority, and when I finish it, I'll come back to you. So you've got to just be transparent. It's not hard. Makes the world of difference. And that doesn't mean see, you don't even be a leader. This could be with with your partner in, in life. Sorry, dear, <laughs> I've got to do this first. It's a priority to me. Then I'll come and help you. Not just say no, because no is quite cutting. So keep that in mind. It's all about quite often it's the delivery of how you do things. Right? It's not necessarily where your intentions may be right or wrong. It's the key is. How you deliver, like oh, if your intention's right, it's how you deliver it. Because quite often can turn out wrong. And people often say that to me. Oh, yeah, but they, I've been told I've got to look after myself at times. Yeah, well, that's fine. Just tell other people. That's what you're doing. Don't just say, no, I can't help you. And wander off. And in, in a leadership case, and they say, yeah, but, 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 but Ross, can you help me? Yeah. Well, the question will be, as I mentioned the other day, everything's in questions. The question would be whether this is a priority or is this what you're doing is a priority, which is the which is the most important. Then you talk about it. And maybe theirs is more important in this case. Who knows? But the fact is you talk about it. It's open and people have a discussion and no one's getting upset. That's the key. So the next behaviour is... Oh, where have I got? It's... Um, Innovation. How do you innovate? Now, I know we're looking at 
uh, in the business angle here and how you grow as a grow a business and how you grow as a person. Innovation is also important. And and where I see this, there again, the, the paradoxical behaviours are, one, am I persistent? In other, words, in other words, the tendency to be tenacious despite encountering obstacles. At the other end of that scale is experimenting. That's the tendency to try new things and new ways of doing things. You have to be both. And I see it in, in, in real life. People who, who enjoy the experiment, they never finish any, They never finish anything. As soon as they get to the first hurdle, and I call them sometimes a speed bump, it's not a road bump, it's a speed bump. They stop and try and do it in another way. And they never finish because there's always going to be speed bumps. Then the, then the person who's ultra persistent and resilient and just keeps pushing. The problem there is it's like the old wind up toy that didn't go backwards. It hits, it hits it's a battery toy, it hits the wall and just keeps hitting that wall until the battery runs out. In your case, you have a health problem because you haven't learned to stop. Look at what you're doing. Is this a speed bump or is it a roadblock? If it's a speed bump, I keep going and persist. If it's a roadblock, I've probably got to have to pivot. That's the difference. Maybe this path isn't quite right. I may have to make some adjustments. But you don't do that the first time you hit, a, you hit what I say, a speed bump, the slightest obstacle, and then you stop and start wandering off a different direction. The key is you, that's the key to leading, self-leading. You're starting to analyse where I am at that time. And at, and at the end of the day, if your gut keeps telling you, no, this is right, it's probably right. You keep going. The gut will tell you, eventually, this is not right. I better change. I better pivot. Just look at the slightly different path. Still going to where I want to head, but I'm going to take a different road. Same city I'm heading to, but I'm taking a different road. This one's a roadblock. That's that's all. Eventually, you may have to go to a different city, but that's up to you to keep going within yourself to see, is this is my gut telling me this is right, this is right? Okay, I'll keep moving forward. Because your persistence is, is basically fueled by your belief in self. But at the same time, use your brain to analyse where I am and do I need to pivot? But, but your gut will tell you long term what's right. So then we move to the next one. Where are we? What have we done? Oh, done that one, done that one, done that one. It went the wrong way. So you ask yourself the question, do I explore new ideas for the purpose of gaining value, the ability to think creatively, problem solving, as well as functional and, and or technical abilities? So I'm looking at creating value. Now, we talked on Monday about having a growth mindset in, in depth where, where you want to have a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. And yes, so that's that's really a similar behaviour. I have a growth mindset, but it's a mindset that I say, well, I've got to explore new ideas. Yes, you have to, but you don't run to it the first time you meet that, that roadblock or that speed bump. So the other thing is when you're doing an experimenting, it, experimenting takes you out of your comfort zone. And when you're trying to move down a path and run your own path, no one's been down that path, most likely, which would mean that you're taking a risk. But don't, whatever you do, don't fear failure. And just maybe those roadblocks you're hitting or the speed bumps you're hitting, when you get to a roadblock, it's teaching you a lesson of how to do it in a better way. Then you start still looking at the experiment. But you need to persist first. What's happened here? No, that's it. Right. Now we move on to the next one. It's organisation. Am I organised or how flexible I want to be? See, flexible, experimenting, very similar. A lot of these are very similar. Now, the key is, am I organised? And the organisation means I'm orderliness, I create efficiency, flexible, and flexibility supports my longevity. Nature is the perfect example of 
of being orderly in the context of constant change. You must have some orderliness in your life. If you're too flexible, you won't get anywhere. It's a bit like I'm too, I love to experiment too much. The flexibility is a tend to easily adapt to change. Yes, we must do that. But at the same time, it must be relatively organised, orderly. And I'll give you an example. Um, why it must, it must have some organisation in it. I was coaching an executive who came onto this project, very senior engineer, and, and he, he comes on, he had a six-month part of this project. And the project head said to me, you've got to go and talk to this guy. He's turning up, he's been here a couple of weeks or a month, wherever it was. He turns up at me and he's unprepared. And when, when he comes there, he's flopping around and people ask him questions and he say, oh, I can't answer, I'll have to get back to you. It was just a bit of a disaster. And he said, anyway, try and fix him or you'll be off the project in about two weeks. We, we, can't, we can't put up with that. So he was unorganised. He was very flexible, too flexible. So when I went to his office, I couldn't sit anywhere. He had files all over the place. See, unorganised. And the trouble is with the brain, when you come into that office in the morning, the brain subconsciously sucks in all the energy of all the different files into his head. So he could never concentrate on anything. It was all in there. So he was having a, a couple of days off. And I said, I used it. This is great. I said, when you come back, this office is going to be clean. So I got his assistants to clean the damn thing, put files and filing cabinets and all that to do. Gone with the day. This is before he had use of laptop, massive plans and building plans and all that sort of stuff laid out everywhere. Anyway, he goes away and comes back and see when he comes into his office, he's thinking clearly because there's nothing there overwhelming him of what he's got to be doing today. He thinks that the first thing he's got to do, oh, I'm going to do such and such, grabs, get his, gets his assistant. He wasn't allowed to go to the filing cabinets, asked for a file, and they weren't allowed to have him more than about two or three on his desk in his office. We kept doing it, and suddenly he turned up at meetings organised, spot on, answer quick. Why? Because he could concentrate. So that's what I mean about organised. You need some organisation, all in this, in your, in your life, but you still need to be flexible to adapt to change. So there again, ask yourself and be honest. Are you neat and tidy and like to maintain order? And now if you're too neat and tidy, it can become too much. So the slightest disruption can send you a bit funny, right? So it's about mixing it. So I am an am I messy. There's nothing wrong with either. You just need to have a bit of a balance. That's all I'm saying. Now we move to another trait. It's how you delegate. Now that's delegating in a management leadership role or delegating in life. Asking your partner to do something for you. That all those things are the same skill. Um, so when you're looking at that, the two traits are authoritative. In other words, or what, what, what the combination delegation you want is never hesitate to take counsel from a program, but always take full responsibility for own decisions. In other words, yes, I can collaborate and talk to people, but at the same time, I've got to be responsible for it. I'm accountable for it. It's my, it's what I'm, what I do. It's what, what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm happy to collaborate and get an opinion or get people to help me. We both work together. The key is there again, but I, I take the ownership. People think that collaboration or empowerment means if you throw it over the fence, they do it. And if they, they, if they make, a, a, make a mess of it, then you've got them to blame. Unfortunately, that's not good leadership. That's very poor leadership. So the key is you want to be authoritative. The decision-making decision is there with you. At the same time, you, 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 you encompass other people and seek and help them and, and, and encourage them to be part of the decision. So ask yourself and, and think about it. Determine what you will delegate if you're looking at it, if you're a leader or a group of people, or even someone with a bunch of friends, what are you going to delegate out or what are you going to do? Effective delegation begins by defining 
the responsibilities, clarifying the desired rate, results, etc. But you're still responsible for it. And if you're not responsible for some of those responsibilities, then make sure that those people own it. And the expectation of everyone is very, very clear. That's to clarify the desired results, et cetera, et cetera. This is, there again, this is where the muddy, it, the, the, the clear water becomes muddy because it's not done properly. It's assumed. You need to be very clear with it. Now, what we move to now is driving and, and enforcing. This one causes a few issues too. And that's um, you're you're enforcing that the tendency to insist upon rules being followed. At the same time, you have a tendency to express positive feelings and affinity towards others. In other words, I'll give you an example of what I mean here. You've got a company, you've got a you've got a regulation or um, a rule or whatever you want to call it, where there again, you, you got to, you finish work at 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. You finish work at 5. Someone comes and asks you, oh, Ross, they come and ask me, oh, Ross, can I go home at 4 o'clock? My cat's just died. Whatever whatever excuse, doesn't really matter. Can I go home at 4 because I've got to go and sort that out? Now, when you want an empathy, you go, oh, yeah, well, I can understand your, your cat dying or your, your wife or husband's sick at home. I can understand that. So you, that's your empathy. Okay, you can go. Sometimes if you too much want empathy, then people start to abuse it. They'll come and ask you for any sort of reason, or their husband or wife's very sick, very regularly, doesn't matter. The fact is you just say they go. See, the problem with too much want and empathy is that the people who have got to, now got to take over the slack that that person's left by the fact they've gone home early, they, then, then they start to fire up a bit because they're, over, they're being punished someone for your warmth and empathy on one person and you can't let them all go you'll have a hell of a problem with your customers right so these are the things right so do you enforce the rule to say no the rule is we work to five o'clock and you've got to and you've got to work to that time there's a lot of bosses that stick, stick to those regulations the key is you've got to under, you've got to be a bit of balance so if someone comes to you and i see this regularly right they say oh look i'm going to go and look it's we like flexible hours these days, but in some occupations you can't, right? So someone comes in, look, I've got to go early because of this or this, whatever it is. Then all you've got to do is not say yes or no, say, have you got a cover for your role? You get a cover, happy for you to go. The reason why I say, have you got a cover? Because if you go and leave that, what, what are we going to tell the customers who might ring in the next hour or so? And don't get it, then the phone doesn't get answered. How are we going to deal with that? So you ask them questions. Oh, because too busy sometimes people think of their, their own issue and not the bigger picture. So all you've got to do that. So look, you, you get that organized, happy for you to go home early. See, that's the difference. It's making people accountable for some of those, those type of examples, right? And, and there again, it's just a conversation. But you make them accountable for, for what they're asking. But it is a common one as we as we, we often see. So you ask yourself, what do I do? Do I always stick to the rules no matter what? Which shows lack of empathy, and that what the, and that's what people say. I oh, person, yeah, total no empathy, doesn't appreciate, doesn't understand. It's about common, it's about a both. So do I feel sorry for people without considering the consequences? So it's about considering people's feelings, but also the consequences and having to talk to them about it. That's all it is. It's a conversation. Now, if they keep saying, no, 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 I'd rather, I want to, I've got to go, I've got to go, forget the customers, then maybe that person's in the wrong job. Who knows? Maybe you'll have that conversation another day. But the fact is you have that conversation and it makes life easier. Right, we'll move on to the next. The next one I want to just look at is strategic. Initiating strategy, having the courage to pursue a success, but understanding that managing the risk, uh, but understanding the risks, which is like a mindful courage. See, risking is the, the risking is the tendency to feel comfortable with business ventures that involve uncertainty. 
And some people, like entrepreneurs, they have to feel that. They have to understand there's a risk. And they know that. But at the same time, a lot fail because they just totally live in the risk area. They don't analyse what could go wrong. And, and you get a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but you've got to focus on the positive. Yes, you've got to. But at the same time, analysing a pitfall is not necessarily a negative and you're attracting negative energy. It's just a matter of saying what could go wrong and what would happen if, we, if something like that goes wrong? What do we do? Simple question. Now, you might answer and go, okay, we could do this and this, or and that's fine. But let's focus now back onto the positive. So if you don't plan for anything when it comes to what could go wrong, that can often fail a business. It's not always, but often can fail a business. So what I'm getting at is just accept the fact that look at what may go wrong, but don't live there. So if you live in where what can go wrong, you won't do anything. So you'll never do anything because you'll always, you'll always find something that will go wrong. So yes, it's focusing on the positives with just a few little fail safes that are there, but you don't focus on them. You move back to the positive. You do, they're just there. So you ask yourself there, do I, am I comfortable with uncertainty? And at the end of the day, entrepreneurs and all leaders, really, uh, good leaders, are comfortable with uncertainty. They're comfortable feeling uncomfortable because leading a lot of people is uncomfortable. In any leadership, senior leadership position, there's a lot of uncertainty. So you just got to be the only thing in the life we have now, the only certainty we have in life, that we have uncertainty. That's it. And if you're certain about the fact there's going to be uncertainty, then you then will need to be comfortable with it. If you're waiting for certainty to happen, it's not going to happen. If you want to lead or lead yourself and really push forward and grow and if you just want to become a vegetable living, living in a, in, uh, you know, by yourself in a room, some dark room somewhere, that's fine. But stick to your comfort zone, very comfort zone. You won't go anywhere. You'll still be there in 50 years. You've got to push yourself to feel uncomfortable and just accept I'm comfortable with it. Just tell yourself, I'm comfortable feeling this way. So that's that's another one I work with, with executives. Do I, need, do I need it all clear knowing what I can go what can go wrong? The fear of the unknown doesn't consume me, but still, but I still know which is that one, right? I still know what can go wrong, but I'm not going to look, I'm not going to focus on that too much detail, but I still in the big picture, I know what can go wrong. But I'm not going to live there. I'll be uncomfortable with the possibility that could go wrong, and I'll just keep pushing forward. That's what you need to be looking at. So we move to the next one. Now we're going to talk about, so that's more the paradox in those areas. And so when you look, I'll just finish on this one again, just to reconfirm. See, under pressure, if you're always taking a risk and under a lot of pressure, you'll suddenly, be, you'll suddenly become horribly stubborn and won't move because your brain has realised, hell, I haven't taken anything in, the, I haven't done a, given a balanced decision so whatever I was doing all the time, I'll revert to the, you mentally go to the opposite. So that's what happens there. So when any of these I give you, under a lot of pressure, you revert to the opposite. So someone who's always, for example, analysing and not moving forward under a lot of pressure, come on, Ross, make a decision, come on, come on. And I go, oh, what the heck, let's go. So you go the other way, totally. That's what I mean by being balanced. When your brain considers both behaviours that are paradoxically there, either end of the that, you know, either end of the scale, your brain subconsciously working through the two, you become you, know, you lose your volatility and you become balanced. And when you're balanced, people will flock to you. As I mentioned on Monday, one thing people hate about people is the volatility. They hate volatility in people that they're reporting to or just even as friends. One day you're, they're walking. You're walking in eggshells, the next day they're patting you on the back, giving you a hug. They hate it, right? The key is you're balanced because you're looking at both behaviours and perspectives 
and you make a balance, they said, not 50% necessarily, 60, 40, that's fine, but they're relatively balanced because you take both perspectives into consideration when you make a decision or when you're in your behavior. And so whatever happens, how uncertain it is, how calm it is, doesn't matter. You still make the same decision. So we move on to the next one. I'm going to talk about now just a few. There's a there's a book. Um, I meant to bring it just to show, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. Yet. It's probably not in print now. But there's a book, a research book, by, written by a colleague of mine, who interviewed about you know, a couple of hundred very senior CEOs around the world. We, we've just done some work with them, um, just on and asked them questions. And one question we asked about, or some of them, is what they think is the personal qualities and attributes. A very like a leader would have. Now I can say a CEO needs that. Yes, they do. But so does a, anyone need it to lead yourself in your life. You also need it. it you don't have to be a CEO, CEO of Chevron Oil or Mobile Oil or, or anyone. It doesn't have to be. The fact is, you're 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 the CEO of your life, and so these qualities are very very true. It doesn't matter where it is. So the key is. Couple of attributes, intellectual curiosity and continuous learning. That growth mindset again, that's where it comes from. You've got to be intellectually curious. In other words, you've got to be just look, just curious, ask questions for people. All the good leaders ask good questions. They learn more from questions than asking questions they do by telling. Telling anyone anything, you don't learn anything. You're only telling others what you think. If the key is, I want to know what others think. That's how I learn. That's funny. I I do I, I do a lot of mentoring and, and I, I, I'm very young, the youth and young people who, who want the older grey-haired person mentoring. But I learn just as much from a mentoring session with an 18-year-old or a 25-year-old in Nigeria or an 18-year-old in Australia or in Hong Kong. doesn't matter. I learn so much. Anyway, everyone can teach you something. So I'm always curious about anything I do, interaction, and that's the key. And therefore I know I'll continue to learn. So that's the skill set, the self-leadership. Then also the resilience. See, resilience is a belief in your inner self. If you don't believe in yourself, you won't be resilient. It's the, it's the belief in self fuels your resilience. That's the willingness to keep going. No matter how many knocks you're getting, you keep going. Why? Because you believe in yourself. You believe that you're going to win, but you believe in I'm going to do this. As I mentioned earlier, just be smart enough to realise that maybe I might have to change, pivot, and move to a different path to where I'm heading. That's all. But the resilience is the belief in self. So keep that in mind. So then we move to self-awareness and humility. You need to be aware of yourself and the impact of your behaviours. And when I say self-awareness, I don't mean I can give a description like a management style particularly, yes. And, and as I said, I'm not knocking the style. That's just an overall description. But And people, they, they think, oh, I'm self-aware because they'll tell me what style they are. I say, okay, let's, let's focus on behaviours. Then, then once you understand the impact of your behaviours, then you're truly self-aware. Self-awareness is about the impact you have on other people. That's the key with self-awareness. Now, at the same time, it's you need to be in connection with your inner self, your belief in self. Those two need to be connected. Because if one's there and you understand the impact and you're telling yourself that you're making a negative impact on people every day of the week, then that's not going to help you. It starts with the belief in self and then be aware of the impact of what you do, say and do with people. And then you start to realise how I can manage my life and be a better person, the person I want to be, which we'll finish on again today, like we did Monday. The other one's humility. That, and there again, that's that self-belief we talked about on Monday is that 
yes, I know I'm quite confident in who I am, but I'm humble enough to realise that I don't know everything. And I'm and I'm, I'm quite happy to tell people, sorry about that, I stuffed that up. I apologise. And it's funny, when you have that humility, people trust you more. If you hide any of that information about, and don't say sorry or don't admit that you made a mistake, people just don't quite trust you. Because they know, you, they can tell in your body language that you're hiding something. They don't know what it is, but they know you're hiding something. Or they do know what it is in some cases that they know you stuffed up, but you're not going to admit it. So then they, then they think, well, if they're not telling the truth here, what other what other things do you tell us that aren't truth? It, it can be not even a conscious reaction, it's a subconscious reaction. Either way, they won't trust you. The more humble you are humil and the more humility you show, the more people trust you. And then you say, look, I'm sorry. I, I caused a hell of a problem here. They'll trust you more because you had a strength enough of character to admit it. Makes a big difference. And the other one, next one, is dispassionate compassion. That is having empathy for people but not being involved in their life so much that you can sit back and, like the other one says, it, it stick to the regulation or whatever's there. But you need to have compassion for it, but it doesn't, you don't get get hung up by their problem. See, if a psychologist got hung up with people's problem, they'd jump out the building after about two days because it'd drive you nuts listening to everyone, so to speak. But everyone's you're listening to everyone's problems, you, and you're living them all the time, you'd, you'd never sleep again. You've got to be dispassionate. You've got to, yes, I, I empathize with you, I understand. What we've got to do here is this. And I'll help you through it, but I'm not getting emotionally involved. That's dispassion and compassion. And that's how you need to be as a true friend. Because empathy is not sympathy. People get it mixed up. Sympathy means you get involved and feel so sorry for someone and, 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 and join them on this on that on their emotion. Empathy is I understand your emotion, but I've got to be reasonably dispassionate, so I can now help you. If I if I adhere to the same emotion, we're in the same pond, the muddy pond together. I'm going to stay out of the money pond to pull you out. But I understand where you are, I understand your problem. That's the difference. So always keep that in mind. And just a few more, a couple more attributes, the integrity. There again, if you stay true to your inner self, I've never known anyone's soul to have bad integrity. <laughs> oh. Whenever someone, that's why I say lead from yourself, lead, leadership needs to be soul inspired. It never wishes, never does anything ill of anyone. Where the, where the battles and the fights that happen around the world, all in the head. It's your mind telling you, I'm going to, this is this so and so, I'm better than that person, I'm better, that country's better than us, or they're, they're robbing us, all that, whatever it is, all up here. When you get down to the emotional soul and connection, they don't wish ill of anyone. So I take leaders there who are struggling. When they get to connect with their inner self, amazing what the difference is in their behaviour and their understanding. Things like empathy and all that start to, they get, becomes clearer because they're attached. That's where the empathy comes from. And and when you're dealing with the inner self, that's where the courage comes from. Because there again, you'd like the other one, self-belief. It's the belief that you can do this. You've got this. All your courage comes from this work. Fear, not a problem. Yes, it's there, but I walk through fear because I have this belief, this little light in my soul here, shining bright, brightly, and it will take me through it. The resilience. So just a couple of hints before we finish. More managing practice. Well, there again, no different. Don't be a manager of anyone. Say you manage yourself because you're managing and you're with people, you're interacting with your friends, doesn't matter your family. You always provide people with timely feedback and acknowledgement. You acknowledge people. You give them credit where the credit's due. But if they need to have a message, don't be afraid to tell them. But as I said earlier, and we did on Monday, say it in a way that's more diplomatic and encouraging. Where they want to change to that, rather than fighting you and, that, and disagreeing with you, so I'm not there yet. 
and become an argument, they're, not, they're, they're getting too hurt about what you're saying. Just say it in a good way. And encourage, always encourage with your friend, divergent opinions. There again, that's that growth mindset. You're looking that you're not the expert of everything. So you continually learn this intellectual curiosity again. And if you're managing people, this is probably more for managers here, um, we are talking management styles, always hell, hold yourself accountable to act on competence and performance issues. Don't get too sympathetic that I can't, I don't want to let people go. I don't want to, they're in the, you know, that I know they're in the wrong job, but I don't want to upset them or whatever. That doesn't do them any favour. If they're not performing, they're in the wrong job. Either you're the worst leader in the world or they're in the wrong job. That's basically only two reasons why people don't perform. Now, if you're a pretty good leader, you've got to hold yourself accountable to do something about it. Now, I'm probably running out of time. I'll give you an example, but I'm probably running out of time. Um, actually, I'll, I'll say it anyway. Cause it, many years ago, I, there's, there's one lady that was working for me that just wasn't just having the she wasn't bad at what she's doing, very efficient, but not interacting with customers so well. So in the end, I had, to, I had to have a big chat to her. I tried to change. It didn't work. So I said, I've just got to let you go. Well, I think at that moment, she would have thrown me out the window if she's physically capable. And she probably was, actually. So I was a bit worried there for a minute. But it really upset her. It really, I can tell you, man, it upset her. Anyway... About six months later, she wrote me the nicest. Oh, no, she didn't write me that. She followed up with a nice letter. She she came to the reception and said, ask to see me. And I went, oh, hell, this is not going to be good. The assistant said, oh, I won't mention her name. What's the see her? Anyway, she comes in and she gave me a hug. Because she said, I was so upset with you, I wanted to murder you for the first few days. But in the day, I got to thinking what you're saying. Because I was saying she's in the wrong job. Go and work for the government because you like to be efficient. You like you like ticking boxes. You like going, having an inbox to an outbox. But every every person interaction with you was a was a was an interruption in your mind. I said, get something where you don't need to talk to customers, where there's no interruption. And she said, I'm in this job now. <laughs> I'm like I'm in a whatever she's in, but she has no interaction with any customer. And in basket and out basket, she said, I love it. I only wish I'd done this years ago. This is what I love. See, honestly, you'll be amazed if you move people, you'll be amazed because they're in the wrong job. That's why there's problems. I mentioned on Mono. If you like 75% of what you're doing, you'll be good at it. She liked about 40% of what she was doing before. Now she likes about 90%. So she's gone to struggling to be good, to be good at her job. So keep that in mind. And I said, there's a couple of things here, just quick. Assess, say, use your candor, that's humility, be open, honest, all these things. So we get back to the final thing, which I left on Monday about, how do you want to be described as a leader? Have a deep think about it. And then you look at, what have I got to do every day in order for people to describe me that? Now, if you're not leading a team, how do I want to be described as a friend? What am I going to do every day for people to describe me that way? Now, it mightn't be, I want to be helpful. Yeah, but there again, in, keep in mind, if you're super helpful and don't look after yourself, one day under pressure, you come and bite their head off. You'd be so ag ag aggro towards them because you're under too much pressure. And then they'll see you as volatile. Right? So you've got to say, yes, I want to be helpful. But at the same time, I need to look after myself. But I want my friends to say, yes, Ross is always helpful. And, you know, it's, he will be helpful at some point, but he, he does respect what he needs to be doing for himself, which is what they want if they're good friends. If they don't want that, then why have you got them as a friend? All they want to do is use you. So, again, you ask the question. So keep that in mind. So you can use this exercise as a friend, a husband, a wife, brother, a sister, doesn't really matter. But as a leader, how do I want to lead myself? And then you work out the behaviours based on that description. Okay, that's very any any questions. Thank you so much for this well explanatory uh, 
this presentation you have given us this early morning. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate oh, you, especially when you elaborated more on this behavior in leadership, which is very, very important. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. Just as our Honorable Keith have said, it's time for questions and discussions. So any questions, please? Let's ask questions. I'm waiting for questions. Um, Ambassador Dennis, you are a leader and you are also the teachers of teachers. Do you have any questions now? Because it's very important that we ask questions. Ambassador Professor Dr. Mercy, you are amazing. You have great, great um, organization, institution. And we're talking about leadership here. And we've gone through it for the past one hour. So please ask your questions. Sir, so, I would like to ask one question about this leadership. Yep. I know it's, I mean, it's all based on personal development. It Sometimes is. I mean, you prepare. It starts itself. Yeah. Yes, it's all based on personal development because if you can build yourself up, if you can organize yourself, if you can lead yourself, then you can lead others. Yeah, if, if you can, as long as you want it, then you can. Exactly. If, if you can't lead yourself, you will never be able to lead others. Exactly. So that is the most important thing. But you might manage the... them in, in title, but you'd never be successful. Yeah. Yes. And through that, there will always be challenges, sir. There will always be challenges. Yes, there will. Um, disappointment, critics, and even a crisis and other things like that. Can you share with us quickly one or two or even three challenges that a, an effective leader, despite the fact that they've prepared themselves, they're well organized, they, you know, they develop themselves and they're ready to lead others, but there will always be challenges. So they can you, yeah. challenges, you challenges, people, yes. So, yeah. Can you share with us what kind, I mean, how, some of the challenges and how can we overcome it as a leader? Well, I'll give you one big challenge that is very obvious is I was working for a company in, in oil, oil and gas at the time, was doing some coaching there when COVID hit. Now, not only was COVID, <laughs> did COVID hit and we have all these problems and suddenly everyone's got to stay at home with all the issues. They had a, 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 a falling oil price that plummeted because the plane stopped, everything stopped. So where's the oil price go? Right down. So you've got about five, 6,000 people whose livelihoods depend on, on what they're doing and suddenly that's gone. So it's a, it's, a, it's a cup of crises. Everyone had a crisis, the fact that suddenly everyone's at home, what are we going to do with the business? This was a double, a bit like the airlines, they had a double crisis that they no, no longer earning income. So, uh, and their, 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 the value of their assets just suddenly went south very big, right? So, and there again, so there again, people wait, were waiting. I, the, and I was, man, I was coaching the, the guy in charge, right? And he said, oh, I've got a, got a, I've got a, I've got a meeting coming up and, and you've got several thousand employees all in a town hall in different parts of a couple of countries. And, what do you, you know, what do I, so we talked about it. And as I mentioned before, just admit it. And, and, I, and I also said on, on Monday, the one certain, I think I said it today, the one thing about uncertainty is you can be certain about it. But when you control, the only thing you can admit you can do and promise you can do is something in your control. He had nothing in his control, and but yet, we had all these staff are wanting to hear something to make them feel a bit at ease because they're all terrified. They'll lose their job, they'll be all these sorts of issues. Um, and we, we talked about it, and he was a good leader. So he just said, Well, I've just got to be honest. 
<laughs> yes, you do. Good. So we just, I basically got on there and said, look, because people are saying, you know, Give us, they're all looking for this something to help them get through it, right? And some leaders then promised too much. Oh, we'll be right, we can do this. He just got on and said, Look, guys, I'm a no, I'm a no different, I'm no different to where you are. I'm struggling with the, the overall the worries about the health, all these sorts of things. But I'll only promise you one thing, and the one thing that I can control, because the rest is out of control at the moment. We don't even know where this is going to end. We don't even know we're even going to have a business in a few years' time. I'm sure we will, but as to what it's going to be and what the oil price could be, I'd hate to think. But the one thing I can promise you is I'll do everything I can possibly do that's going to help this business survive. And he could say that with passion. He could say it with belief. And he, that he could control. Now, whether... People have to be put off. He did everything. He said, I can do everything possible to do to make sure all of you people are okay. I can't promise. We will all be here in a year. Because that's irresponsible. You may all well be. Hell, we might even have extras. I don't know. But I'll tell you, I'll give my best to keeping you all safe and secure in whatever we're going to be doing as we move forward. See, that's what he's got to control. Like, you can always promise to do your best. See, that's humility. That's admitting that you're not a genius. Like, and everyone's waiting for some positive word. Just tell them that, because that's positive. The positive is, I'll do my damn best. And everyone starts to feel enthusiastic. He's going to do it. He looks sincere. He feels sincere. We trust him. Why? Because he's honest. If he'd come out and said, oh, no, we'll be right, we'll bounce back, we'll do it. They'd go, oh, yeah, right, eh? Corporate speak. And they would have wandered off, not feeling any more confident than what they were before they went on. But he had a really good effect because he's open and he's honest. And when you're promising something, you don't overpromise. You just promise what you know you can deliver. And in this in this world, there's, <laughs> there's not a lot of things, but what you can promise, I can damn well do my best and give it all my energy. That's a great word. That's a great word. Because it makes us to maintain our credibility. It also makes us to stay on being integrity. So you don't That's promise right. what you can do, but what you promise always make sure that you take a um, responsibility for it and deliver what you promise. That's right. Wow. And when a thing's a bit of a problem, you'd, you'd send them out to the transparent. I'm trying to do this, it's not quite working at the moment, or I'm trying to keep this unit going, it's not quite, like he was pretty, he kept them reasonably informed. It's, it's some things you can't inform people that, you know, that are a bit more a bit more personal with some things, but yeah, but generally he kept them informed. So they just trusted him that he's doing his best. That's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have another question on the yep. platform from Ambassador Dennis A. Yomi from Liberia. And, yes, uh, and his question is, what are the key components of effective leadership coach, sir? Coaching, sir. Competencies of a coach. Yes. That's, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, the, <laughs> the biggest, the biggest competency is you need to lead yourself. You need to be able to lead yourself because how can you coach leaders if you can't lead yourself? As, as I've said all the time, must you must lead yourself. So that's the first competency. That underpins everything else. There again, it's also the fact, if you're looking at the, the next level competencies, it's that communicate because you, you can't coach or help people if you don't deliver what needs to be said. Mm -hmm. But you can't do it bluntly because... People just won't have your back. You'll upset them too much. You've got to have the ability to deliver a message that needs to be said, but in a constructive way, they feel supported. So, but there again, you, you do it by asking questions. You're not you're not there lecturing. As a coach, don't lecture. They ask damn good questions, and the question they ask is leading to where the problem is, because you're trying to rationalise with that person to learn 
by the fact, the way you ask the question and giving the answer. Quite often they go, oh, I see what you mean, Ross. Yeah. And because they tell themselves, they remember it. If you just sit there and lecture, they don't remember two-thirds of the information. They'll do it again, right? So you, <laughs> I mean, sure, you've got to tell them something sometimes, but the key is the competency is the ability to ask questions and listen to them, but ask questions that are smart, leading to where the problem is. Excellent. So they're, they're too, and the fact that you connect with people, that's probably the other one. But if you're a really good leader of self, you'll be able to connect with people. Connect. Generally speaking, you can connect. Yeah, that is excellent. Excellent. Another question, sir, before you go. <laughs> because we have to train them out to ask questions because that is the only way they know better. That's the only way you learn. You're talking, about <laughs> wisdom. You're talking about wisdom earlier, Elizabeth. The only way you can get wisdom is ask questions. You don't get it any other way. Yes. yes. Anyone who's considered around the world of, of, of have deep wisdom, that's the first thing I'll say. You ask questions. Curious. There again, curious, intellectual curiosity. You ask questions. Yes. Very, very important. So another person, after listening to those compliments, can you elaborate on them? On which one? Sorry, on the, you know, you just mentioned um, the component of oh, effective the, leadership. Yeah, I okay. think it, yes, I think he just wants you to clarify, I mean, to... Oh, clarify it, okay. So, yeah, to elaborate it more. The ability to lead, the ability to lead yourself is your self-discipline, your belief in self, in, and then you're looking at the other leadership things of, of the ability to have a, a, a growth mindset, have an opinion, at the same time, accept the fact that you can learn something new every day. See, that's all the self-leadership ones. Um, and and then when you when you talk to, you have the ability to give good feedback. And that's that communication one we talked about on Monday. Yes, yeah, so I've got to tell someone what they need to hear. At the same time, I, I need to do it in a constructive way. And I, I, we're running out of time. I could give you an example if you want, but it'll take me three minutes, four minutes. Yes, we have one too. Oh, you want to. I'll give you an example. Okay. So if, let's say you're a leader. You're, you're leading this team of people and you ask them to deliver a presentation on your behalf. You're not doing it, so you're empowering this person to deliver this presentation. You empower them to come up with the slides, all the sort of information. They're going to send them out to some office somewhere in the part of the organisation to deliver this new idea, new product. And so you gave them a requirement. Look, these people... They, they open the customer doors at 9 o'clock. I can get them early at 8 o'clock. You've got an hour to deliver the, deliver the new product line in this presentation. So there's all your scope. Off you go then, right on. You come back and show me that you're happy and all that. If you want support, I'm happy to support you. Anyway, well, there's a few other things you can go to. I'm rushing through this. So they, 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 this person goes off to deliver this talk, presentation. And... And so at the end of that, you think, okay, I'll just ring the, the some of the staff and see how how Ross went, right? So you ring up the staff and see how Ross went, then and they say, oh, look, we, we were a bit, we, we, there's a few of us quite upset about the presentation. Rule number one, what specifically upsets you? Mm. See, we, we're not talking about opinions. We're talking about behaviour. What, oh, well... Well, when we ask, people want to know some more information and they ask Ross the question, he didn't answer them. He put an just kept going. Totally ignored him. Oh. So, then I'd say, what did Ross do right? See, I'm going to give this person feedback. I'm giving Ross feedback when he comes back. I need to know what he did right. Oh, well, he finished on time. Nine o'clock, finished. We could open the customer doors. Ah, good. There's a good point. Yes, the slides are very clear, seem to have a flow, so I'd ask more, more positives. So I'm getting positives. I've got the negative, but I'm getting positives. That's that, right? So that's okay. So I'm giving this person feedback. I'm not just telling the bad news, I've got the good news mm -hmm. as well. See, it's all balance. Life's about balance. So Ross comes in to me uh, that afternoon over a meeting, so I go, how did it go? He said, oh, well, that felt, I think, pretty good. I've got through it all. I said, 
Good. I, I did hear. I did hear you uh, finished on time. All good. Good feedback, and your slides are really well well received. Were there any questions, Ross? Did anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah, there were. Oh, I didn't answer them, did I? Ah, yes, I did hear that. So, what are you going to do next time, Ross, in the next presentation? Well, yeah, well, Ross, maybe you should look at, you know, how many questions? Oh, it might have been four or five. Well, how long will that take? Maybe five minutes. Well, you've got to take five minutes off the slide so you can type a question. Whatever it is, but I'm helping them. See, rather than say, come in, you idiot, what were you thinking? You didn't answer your question. Mm. See, all I do is defend myself. But here, I'm helping Ross, and he thinks, oh, well, he's helping me. I've got the good things I did. And I didn't say, you didn't answer the questions, you idiot. I just said, were there any questions? See, question leading to what the problem is. That's all you've got to do. That's the competency I mean about communication. Now, in life in general, that's what you should be doing, right? It doesn't have to be a coach. Now, if, he, if, if Ross had said to me, no, there weren't, I didn't think there were any questions. Well, the matter of fact, there were because they, they told me there were a few. So let's look at what we can do in the future. It's still not negative. So that's what I mean by when you ask people questions, you're leading into the problem. You're not hitting them in the, in the, in the face of the stick of the problem. You lead them to it, and nine times out of ten, they go, ah, yeah, you're right. Mm. Thank you so that's the much. Major. I mean, and to be a coach, I mean, to be a leader, even to be a person leading yourself, they're, they're critical. And, it, and, and other parts of just connect with people. You need to have empathy for people. But at the same time, just passion and compassion. You've got to be removed enough to help them, but em enough empathy that you actually feel for their issue. You can feel it, but you're not staying there. They're in the muddy water. I'm not jumping in there with them. I'm staying out so I can actually pull them out of it. That's the difference. Excellent. And probably the, they're the biggest, the biggest challenges as a coach. And there's a lot of others, heaps, right, we can look yeah. at. But that's the two main things. Well, three, once you lead yourself, that's the next two. Right. Thank you so much. That's a good answer you've given us there. Before you go, sir, I know you need to go quickly. Um, are you? Can you also answer the last questions before you go, what, sir? What's the last one? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. The last question is, please, sir, what category of leadership will you describe a person with dispassionate compassion. What what part of leadership? Um, see there again in all styles. It should be in all styles because that's what that's a behaviour you must have. So it's in all styles of leadership. That's why I say I don't sit on a style because there's there's positive negative negatives with each style. Um, if you take too broad. Broad styles is on task focus or on people focus. Yeah, but you need to be both. So if I'm people focused, I can live in the dispatch in, in compassion, but I'm too much empathy. And I get the other way, I'm too much task focus, and therefore I, I'm all about being dispassionate from everyone, but not not compassion. So it's about that fact that you you take in both. You need to know you need to hold people accountable for the task. At the same time, you need that compassion, that compassion, the empathy. So dispassionate, all that means is I can I don't get in the river, I don't get in the muddy water with them, but I understand where they are in that muddy water, but I need to stay out of it in order to help them out. That's basically dispassion. Just I'm just far enough removed. There again, like a psychiatrist, they can't feel for every person they see on a day because they'd never sleep. They'll be living in all these people's fears and they've got to talk to them, remove it. No, no different to a surgeon. You've got to treat the person in a surgical mindset, but at the same time have the empathy, what they're going through when you have your your, your session before the before the operation or after. That's the empathy and understanding. At the same time, in that surgery, you've got to be fairly task focused and you can't be feeling too much for them there. You've just got to do your job. So that's that task focus to to people focus it's a bit of both because no. no. if you're too too much on the people side you don't you don't give them 
you don't you keep them in jobs whether they're making money or not kind of just worry about the people so I keep them in a job yeah like you can't do that to run the business it doesn't do any, anyone any favor like that example you've got to, people are in the wrong job quite often so you've got to be dispassionate enough to realize that the business requires a customer service person like the example I gave you <laughs> yes we want efficiency but it requires some of this customer can talk to people, not just task focused. This person lived in the task, they so better off get a job that that's what you that's the focus of the job, all tasks. If that's the if that's the type of person you are, right? So you just gotta understand that people aren't necessarily can do any job. It's where they fit, what fits their purpose, what they enjoy doing. As I said Monday, you enjoy 75% of what you're doing, you'll be good at it. But if it drops below that, that how good you are starts to drop. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate your teaching this morning and, and how you've answered all our questions this morning. is very, very important, and we really appreciate that. It gives us more clarification, better understanding, because it's what we understand that we put in action. If we only go to a seminar and you just listen and you don't have that ability to ask questions, to clarify what you've heard or to get a better understanding, then you won't be able to apply it. And what is that's the right. use? That's, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. What is the use of going to the seminar, master classes, and then listen uh, to all those lectures and you were not able to apply it. It's a waste of time. Mm. So that's why we're encouraging you all to please yes, answer I questions. Agree. And then we want to say thank you to Honorable Ross Kiff that has really be patient enough to answer all our questions. Because believe it, the reason why we started early because Honorable Ross is very busy going from corporate to corporate to, I mean, corporation to corporation to teach them, to lecture them. So we are blessed to have him on our platform. And that is why we appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much for taking out of your time to come and lecture us today. We really, we really appreciate that, sir. I enjoy um, your passion and your belief and the good you're doing. So that's why I'm happy to give you some time. You. Thank you so much. We really appreciate thank that. On behalf of Yes You Can International Academy, we want to say thank you so much. And uh, we've done a good recording and we're going to send them to you as soon as possible through the YouTube. So thank you so much. Sir. And the reason why we record so that we keep learning, because I believe that, yes, we are here and we are reasoning. We are listening to what you've said. But yeah, majority, yes, and yes. we need to revisit the video, read it, I mean, watch it, watch it several times to get more from mm. what you've shared with us. And we also share it on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, so that other people also will have the opportunity to learn from this. Because the better we become, the better we can make a change. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Go back to leading self. <laughs> the better we become is the leading yourself. Having a discipline to lead yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate you. So now we finish first section of the day. Thank you all for joining us so early. I know we have to wake up early, but uh, that's part of uh, sacrifice. <laughs> but I appreciate your time. I appreciate Ambassador Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us. Ambassador Lukeman, or do you still have any question? You can still ask because uh, Honorable Ross is still around if you want to ask questions before he leaves us. So if you have any question, Ambassador Mercy O'Bain, thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. Um, um, Dr. Samina, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Samina, I know you joined um, late, so I don't know if you have any questions for our leader. Do you have any questions at all? Because I don't know if you grab anything, because I know we started very early this morning. But uh, can a leader have a quality of relationship? 
be. My question is, okay. Uh, the uh, leader... Hold on, hold on, second. Let me just make sure that Honorable Ross oh. is still here. Hold on a second. Okay, right. Um, if, okay. There's another one question dropping in in our chat box, <laughs> but I want Doctor Samina. Can you quickly ask your question, please? Business is the service of people, and uh, how we are doing our job in a better way. So, uh, give some points for this service that uh, uh, we are doing our business like a service and uh, we are um, humbly doing this service so that uh, people acknowledge it, that uh, we are serving it, not only we are doing business, but we are really serving them. Highlight uh, this. Did Sorry. you get the, okay? Yeah, Rob, so what, what's the question then out of that? I just didn't quite get the question. But, but if you're looking like there's and, a lot of people talking about servant that, leadership, are you talking about servant leadership? The business is like a service. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah highlight it, elaborate it, please. That well, people think that we are not uh, doing it uh, only for uh, getting money. We are that's serving right. it. That's right. Look, that, that comes all the way through. Now, like businesses focus on the fact of what we do for people to help people, right? Because if you're not in business to help people in whatever whatever shape or form that is, then you won't have a business. And that's no different than leadership because they – a lot of talk about being a servant leader and that's really what that means because you the staff aren't there to serve the leader the leader's there to serve them because it, it's those people who actually get things done the leader's just it's I, I often say all you're doing is rolling a squeaky wheel as a leader the actual engine and the wheels that's just staff you don't drive the wheel, they drive it themselves. If you empower it properly, that rolls along itself. All you're doing is pointing it in the right direction, that's the vision, and then oil it, oil the squeaks. In other words, that's the minor problem that happened along the way, and that's all you have to do. Gone are the days where you lead, leaders lead people into battle. Yes, you need to be the leader for the vision, but you let them move forward themselves. And they've got to think for themselves. They don't wait for orders. So, in effect, you're a servant leader. You're serving them so they can do the best job as a team they can do. So your job is just to serve and make sure they can do that. Now, if you, I don't know, people like, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the sport now. No, it hasn't gone out of my head. But anyway, it, it, it's that, um, oh, I can't think of it, sorry. It's a, uh, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Now, curling. So it's like a curling, which is Olympic sport. And you, and you get one person who runs along and with a broom and sweeps the ice for the other team to bowl the balls down like bowls, right, to get to where they've got to get to. You like the leader's like a curling sweeper. You're clearing the pathway so the rest can do the work. That's all you do. And the pathway is resources, anything, right? That's it. So that's the servant leadership, and, and which is no different to businesses. You're serving. Thank you so much. Dr. Samina, are you pleased with that answer? Dr. Yes, Samina? Yes, ma'am. Good. Yes, okay. ma'am. I am pleased. Thank it's you. It's a very good answer. Good, good. I'm happy. Good. Yes. Asa, I know it's you are good. rushing to leave us soon because you need to go for another meeting somewhere. Mm -hmm. But there's also another particular question on the chat box. Will you be able to ask? Yeah, okay. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm from... Yeah, there are more than questions and quite often everything else. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, the questions from Ambassador Dennis. Um, the question is, can a leader have a quality of relationship? That's a good question there. Have a quality of relationship in what respect? Yes. Can a leader, you know, as leader, can they have, despite all the business, I mean, business and other things, can they still have Equality of relationship. So a quality relationship outside the business. Yeah. Okay. I would say I'm not sure what what he means there. 
And so again, if you're a do good you leader, want to you clarify to your question? So what, what he means by relationship? Yes, which relationship is it outside the business or within the business? Ambassador Dennis, can you quickly clarify that? Quickly, if you can, because if not, we will just well, assume. We will just, just assume. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what the relationship when... is. Okay. 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 Thanks for the the, the training and the seminar, Dr. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, our African Queen. Again, uh, when I talk about the quality of relationship, I mean uh, about our business setting. In our business setting, can we have a quality of relationship within our business? I'm not referring to our personal relationship. Okay. Right. Within the business setting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Look, at the end of the day, leadership, <laughs> leadership's about relationships and, and and you're understanding what type of relationship. That's why I mentioned before, dispassionate compassion. Now, you don't have to be best friends with a lot of your staff but you need to have a relationship where they trust you and they know you've got their back. Now, you might, you might have a friendship a bit closer with some because that, that, that quite often happens for whatever context you're in. At the same time, you must have the dispassionate compassion and the ability that despite this person being a quite a good friend, you, you've got to have to let them go or you've got to have some serious chats to them because they're not doing this well enough. And there again, you might be giving them a favour by the fact you're moving them on or you're having a chat because they didn't realise they had some blind spots. That becomes back to that dispassionate compassion. Yes, I'm, I, have a, I have a closer relationship, so I have a lot of empathy and a lot of connection with this person, but I've got to be able to step back and do what I need to do as a leader. Otherwise, you, otherwise you fail yourself, you fail the business, and you, more importantly, you fail them because they're not getting the right feedback of what they need. So you still got to hold them accountable. So yes, you can have relationships. You still got to have the ability to dispassionately remove yourself to do what, what needs to be done for everyone, for the win-win for everyone. Well, excellent. I hope you are satisfied, Ambassador Dennis. Are you satisfied with your question and with your question? Yes, then I will have one question to ask before you uh, before closing. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if I'm I'm permitted. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that, let's yeah. let's see. Are you? Uh, let me let me let me first of all check with uh, honourable. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have to ask now. Later on. Uh, Ambassador Dennis has um, a very big organization in Liberia where he trained the teachers. Okay. Yeah, so I can understand where he's coming from. <laughs> okay, ask your final question then. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you for answering the first question there. Again, uh, if I must have equality of relationship with my employees, with my, within the business setting, right? Uh, it is compulsory that all of my clients within the business setting, all of my clients, uh, let's say, coaches, mentors, people that I find relationship with or I'm in relationship with, it is uh, important or it is necessary or compulsory that I, I, I have an intimate relationship with everyone that 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 are involved in my business setting. Should my relationship my relationship be intimate? Should I have an intimacy with with those within my business setting? It's oh. I'm looking, there's no right there's no right or wrong. It just depends on the situation, the context. Um it depends how connected you are and how there again dispassionate you can be and passionate you can be. Now I get I and I can I'll blow my own trumpet for a minute here. In my corporate life, um, for, for years after I had people that I even put off had to let go send me Christmas cards. So so the relationship was good enough they kept sending me Christmas cards. One lady I I managed she's one of my managers. <laughs> 
Um, we are we own a couple of things together. Like we used to do meet, mix socially. We still do. When I'm back in Australia, we see each other. But there again, she will tell you that I at some points I sit her down and have a, a serious chat to her because she needed to improve on a couple of areas. Right, that's the dispassionate compassion. You need to be far enough removed to be doing what you need to be doing. At the same time, at times that that relationship is a bit past just having a good relationship, work work boss relationship. It can mean a bit, be a bit further. So. And it, 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 it can run a risk if you, someone takes it too far and then you've got problems, they get hurt. So you've got to watch what you do there. So it's, and that's where the problem is. Um, there again, you, you, your gut feeling tells you what, what you, your gut feeling tells you what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Your heart will tell you. Um, and if it gets too much one way, then maybe you need to do something about it early and make a decision or have a conversation or do something about it early rather than let it meander on and suddenly you've got to, it blows up because the relationship is no longer there and it causes all sorts of problems. I don't know. Look, there's a lot of scenarios you could go to, but just be very communication to be open and clear as you go along that path. I think that is exactly very, I mean, that is exactly the point, especially in every organisation. You've just nailed the point because sometimes we don't balance it. That's right. It's all about and balance. Be yes. And because if we don't balance that relationship or uh, balance the relationship, there's tendency for the co-worker, let's put it that way, or your client to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, if you have a friend or you are too close to one of them or for some of them, there's tendency for them not to perform well because of that relationship. So right. they might You've take it. You've got to remove, manage it. you got to lead it well. You can't just let it go. Exactly. Because yeah. they might take it that, oh, yes, we have good relationship with our boss so we can do whatever we like. So that is why we need to be more conscious and balanced and also to be space, you know, to to be um well I think the best way to say is to balance it. Just mm. and that's it. That's it. You gotta hold balance people account it. for what they need to be doing. All yes, of it. and yeah. then set your boundaries. Mm. There must be boundaries. Yes, it's good to have intimacy, relationship. And be close to your clients and your work, your co-workers, your team. Mm -hmm. But you need to balance, and at the same time, you need to set a boundary. That's right. That's it. All right, communication. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. So you, you are, so thank you so much. Please, please. Um, we need to go now. Yes, it's well presented. They appreciate it on Facebook. Yes, great knowledge of leadership. So that is wonderful. Very nice from Georgia. Um, Sir Honorable Keith, well done. Thank you so much. And great. So that's how the comment. That's it. Yes, that's the comment from Facebook and from us here. We have but all are, as leaders on this platform, well presented. Thank you so much. Um, and they are satisfied with the questions being answered. That is great. That is what we want. And then uh, well presented. Thank you so much, sir. Now we can release you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now we are satisfied. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much. And uh, whenever, whenever we also need you, especially in this area of leadership, we would like to call you back to come and enlighten us more. And we appreciate your time. We appreciate the wealth of knowledge and wisdom you have shared with us. And we really appreciate your care for us as our 
elderly person. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Hey, guys. I appreciate it. Okay, bye, sir. Bye. All right, sir. Bye-bye, sir. Yes, yeah. sir.